a test tomorrow? It's no secret. All right. So show up. And uh, what can I say? I talked about it last, yesterday, I guess it was. So I'm not going to take the time to do that t um, today. All right. So um, seems a little loud. All right. So today I'm going to talk about MATLAB again. And so what I'm going to talk about today that's a little bit different than we've talked about before is actually something having to do with programming, right? So back in the day when I was a student, everyone had to take a programming class. And back then it was Fortran, if you've ever heard of that. And now it's like Java or C++ or Python and things like this. But I find students, most students don't have any knowledge of even rudimentary programming on any level. So we're going to go through some of the basic, very basic things. Obviously, to really learn how to program, you need to take, um, you should learn, you know, take an entire class on that, but that's a different story. So I'm going to give you some of the main programming tools that are available in MATLAB so that if you need to write a little code, a function or something like that, to do something, you would have some idea of how to do it. Um, so to do this, I have to go through three things and then you're going to do a little exercise. The first thing is relational operators. That means like less than or greater than and things like this. Um, second thing is if statements. So if you're writing a program and you need to decide that you're going to only do something under a certain condition, you use that with something called if statement. And then you have these things called for and while loops. These are things that if you want to do a calculation over and over again, you put it in a loop. Okay. And I'll show you how to do those. And then at the end, you're going to do a little uh, example of how to write a piece of code. Okay? All right. So in a nutshell, this is just a little introduction here that uh, MATLAB provides cap So when you use MATLAB, you can do a couple of things. One thing is you can do just all the built-in functions in MATLAB, right? MATLAB has a tremendous number of functions to do different things. And so you can hope that whatever you want to do is available as a code in MATLAB and you can just call it and use it. Um, and these are built-in functions. But you'll often find out you want to do something that MATLAB doesn't directly do. Okay? And to do that, you have to write your own program or, you know, we usually call these codes. And when you write a program or a piece of code, they usually involve common, some common structures that I'm going to introduce to you today. Okay? So, Everyone knows at this point what a command is, right? This is typically a single statement that you type in at the MATLAB prompt, but can be a single statement in a piece of code that you write as well. The two main things you ha that you typically use when you write these programs are conditional statements. That's the idea that you're going to execute a certain set of commands only if certain situation is true. Okay? I'll give you an example of this in a minute. So you don't always execute them. You only execute them if a certain condition is satisfied. That's a conditional statement. And loops is something where you execute a series of commands over and over again until some condition becomes satisfied, some relational condition. Okay? Like you want to do something a hundred times. You just put it through a loop. You don't write a piece of code and copy and paste it a hundred times. <laughs> okay? You go through a loop and do the calculation a hundred times. All right, so in MATLAB, if you haven't seen this before, these are the relational operators. So A and B here are two MATLAB variables. They might, be, um, they might be scalars. They might be vectors of the same dimension. They can even be matrix, matrices of the same dimension. So this is less than, you know, A is less than B is this. This is greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. In MATLAB, this is equal to. <coughs> so you might think equal to is equal, but it's not. It's a double equals, okay? And this symbol here means not equal to, okay? And so when you issue one of these commands, you get back an answer that depends on whether this condition is true or not, okay? <coughs> so if you have defined, I mean, to do this, you have to know A and B have to be defined, okay? So if you issue this command and A and B are defined, and A is less than B, then this will give you an answer of one, okay? It gives you back a logical answer. So if A is less than B and you issue this command, you'll get A and S, right, answer? equals 1. If A is greater than or equal to B, it'll, it'll give you back an answer 0. I'll show you this in a minute. 
And so if A and B are scalars, you get back a single answer. If A and B are vectors, you get back a vector of answers. If A and B are matrix, you get back a matrix of answers. So if A and B is a matrix, for example, it just compares the elements of A and B one by one. Okay? All right, so here's some examples of this. Um, so if I define A to be 1, B to be 2, and I say, basically ask the question, is A less than B? The answer is yes. Right? Obviously, this isn't how you use these commands. <laughs> I'm just showing you how they work. All right? So you can also do this with a vector. So here's, let's say, a vector A. Here's a vector of the same dimension B. And then I issue this command. You understand in MATLAB, you can either type these at, on different lines or you can put semicolons between them and type them all on the same line. I just did this because it saves space on the slide. But, you know, typically you do this one, one at a time. Um, so define A, define B, and then I ask, is B greater than or equal to, to A? Well, it compares element by element, right? Is 3 greater than 1? Yes. Is 2 greater than or equal to 2? Yes. Is 1 greater than or equal to 3? No. Right? So it just gives you back a vector of answers. Do the same thing with a matrix. Okay. So in this case, I have this. This is the identity matrix. Well, not, that's not true. It's not the identity matrix. Um, so it's a matrix with some, one, some ones and a lot of zeros in it. It's a square matrix, three by three. And I ask the question, what elements of A are exactly equal to one? Okay, and that spits back this answer. It's the same as the matrix A. But it tells me that, that one's one, that one's one, and that one's one. Okay? All right. Um, so typically, you're going to use these relational operators to do things like if-then statements, which I'm about to explain to you, are looping, which I'll explain to you in a moment. So if-then statement in MATLAB looks like that, and I'll give you an example in just a minute. So you basically say if some logical, so if something, expression means an expression, one of these kind of things, like that or that or that, okay? So if some expression, if this expression evaluates to true, then it does all the things that are called statements here, okay? Then you might say else if some other expression is true. So for example, you might say, if some, if some numbers 1 do this, if the numbers 2 do this, otherwise do these. Okay? So it just partitions the commands up to only be executed under a certain set of conditions. It's a very common thing that you want to do. Okay? So again, evaluates an expression of the kind just like I showed you, and then executes the group of commands called statements here only if the expression is true. Um, and so you can have as many of these. So first of all, you can just have an if statement. You don't have to have this elf, else if or else. Or you can have lots of these else if statements. You can say, if this is true, do this, else if, do this, else if, do this, until finally at the end, everything else. Okay? So that's what it's saying here. You, these, uh, these, these parts of the command are optional. Um, and once it executes one of these, it's done, right? So if it comes up here and it says, if this is true and then does this, it doesn't, do, doesn't attempt to evaluate any of the rest. It just stops. You understand? So it's only going to do one, if any, of these things. So once it does this one, for example, there's, it, it cannot do these other ones. All right. So here's an example um, to motivate this. You may recall, or you may not, that I made you do an assignment in class that was write a function that solves the quadratic equation. And I wrote one myself, and I called it this thing here. This should look kind of familiar. Right? You, you feed in um, the coefficients as a vector of the polynomial, right? It's a second order polynomial. Um, and then I call these coefficients A, B, and C, and then I evaluate the, the two roots and I return it in a vector called X. This is an assignment you guys did during class a few weeks ago. All right? Um, So, okay, so we learned that, for example, let's see if I have this. You know me, notoriously lazy. Oh, there we go. Right, so we called it like that. We said, so the x is the roots, quadratic is the function, and then we asked for 
please give me the roots of a, of a polynomial that looks like 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. That's what that co those coefficients mean. If you do that, you might get something like this. You can, you know, you can change it arbitrarily. Get that. I want something different. There you go. That's two repeated roots. Okay, let's say for example, so this is just a, for illustration, that you wanted to modify this function such that you only wanted to return real roots. In other words, if the roots weren't real, you just want to tell the user the roots aren't real and you didn't want to return any roots because maybe for the problem of interest, these kind of complex roots don't make any sense. Okay? So what I did is I took this function here and I modified it and the modified function is this one here and being a genius I called it underscore mod for modified. I couldn't come up with anything more clever. And you see it's just the same thing. You're given the coefficient vector here. You call the coefficients a, b, and c. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to determine if the roots are going to be real or imaginary. By first of all, I calculate the discriminant. You remember the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac? <coughs> if that thing is positive, the roots are real, right? And if that thing's negative, the roots are complex. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? It's a quadratic equation. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm calling something called the scrim. You can call it whatever you want, but it's b squared minus 4ac, and then I'm going to check the sign of that. If that discriminant is greater than or equal to zero, then I know the roots are real, right? And then I calculate the roots, and then I return the roots in x, okay? If, if this thing is less than zero, then the roots are complex, and let's say I'm not interested in that. So first of all, I have to return something in x, because if you don't return anything in x, MATLAB will give you an error. So this just means I'm returning nothing. That means not a number. But I have to put something in the vector, okay? And then I'm writing a me I don't think we've been through this command. This displays a message to the user that says the roots are not real, okay? So is this a big advance over just letting the user figure out the roots aren't real? I don't know. But it shows you how to use the if statement, okay? So the key thing here is how I use this, right? So I only want to calculate the roots if they're going to be real, which means the discriminant is going to be greater than zero. Otherwise, nothing. All right, let's see if we like this function. This is um, in the slides. Are the slides posted yet? Okay. So if the roots are real, it works the same way as before, right? But if the roots aren't real, well, <laughs> Didn't I just have some examples where, they, okay, you see that it says <coughs> roots aren't real and just doesn't give you an answer, basically, okay? So that's the kind of thing you can use, um, again, to, if you just want to execute a certain set of commands under a certain condition, use the if-then structure that I just showed you. All right, simple enough, I think. Oh, and there's a couple of examples which I basically already did, something very similar. So. No problem there. <coughs> okay, so there's two kinds of looping structures that are um, generally used in all programming languages. See, the idea here is if, okay, you're not going to learn how to program like an expert in MATLAB from a few lectures that I might give you. Um, but I can tell you, if you were to get a very good grasp of these concepts, the same structures are used in all programming languages. Doesn't matter if it's Fortran or C or Java or Python or whatever you might be interested in, okay? So a for loop looks like this. So the difference between a for loop and a while loop, both these things are where you want to do a set a loop, a loop through, a, execute statements multiple times, okay? So the difference is a for loop executes this some specified number of times, okay? So you might say, please do this 10 times, okay? If you want to do something a number of times, you know how many times it is, then use a for loop. If you want to execute a series of commands over and over again, but only while a certain condition is true and you don't always know when that condition is true, then use a while loop, okay? So the, this does basically, which I'll give you an example, I hope. Yay, okay. Um, so this gives you, an, for this, you just do it a certain number of times, like 10 times or whatever. I'll show you how to make an identity matrix using this. While this while statement, do I have an example of the while statement? I do, okay. Um, the while statement you do while some condition is actually true. So they do the same thing in the sense they loop and execute these same statements multiple times. 
but they do it under a different set of conditions. Okay. Now, unless you know a lot about programming, which I, I assume most, so either if you know program, this is boring to you. And if you don't know, there's no way to understand what I'm saying here without an example, right? It's just cryptic to you. So I'm going to give you one example of a, of a for loop, an example of a while loop, and then I'm going to have you do an exercise. So here is an example of a um, program, okay, that I wrote called identity. It's, an, it's a MATLAB function. And so the idea of this function is you give, it, it's to, it get, constructs the identity matrix. Remember the identity matrix? Square matrix with ones along the diagonal. And the user gives what the dimension of the matrix is, n, okay? And then I spit back the identity matrix as the result. Now, how do I do this? I do this with these for loops, okay? Actually, there's two for loops. Okay, so one represents, so if you look at, this kind of indexing notation for A. A is a matrix I'm going to construct. So uh, the first is the L, I means row and J means column. Okay. So the, what I'm going to do here is I know how many times I want to go through this loop because I know what N is. That's why I use a for loop instead of a while loop. You could use a while loop, but it's not as convenient. <coughs> and so first thing I'm, so what this does, it just goes row by row and this goes column by column. So the first thing I do is set I equal to one. That means first row. And then I set J equal to one, that means first column. So it's the first column, first row, that element. And then I ask the question, is I equal to J? Because if I is equal to J, it means it's along the diagonal. And that means you want it to be one, right? Because that's the identity matrix. Otherwise, you want it to be zero, right? So I'm just, <coughs> just looking for chalk, okay. <laughs> of course, that's impossible to see without the lights on, I think. All right, that's better. So I'm just trying to construct this identity matrix. So right, this is a matrix that looks like this. Right, and it just keeps going. Okay, so basically I just want to put ones along the diagonal of the matrix. That means if, if the row and the column are the same, I want a one there, otherwise I want a zero. So. Again, I here is an index for the row and J is an index for the column. So the first thing I do, the, the way this, this command works is it says for I get 1 to N. So first of all, it sets it equal to 1, does everything, and then when it gets back up, it changes I to 2. So the way this works is first of all, you start I is 1. Then you come down here, J is 1. Okay? Then it decides which of these two it's going to do. It says is I equal J? In this case, they are. They're both 1. So set the 1, 1 element of the matrix A to 1. And then you don't do this, okay? Then you come back up and set J equal to 2. I, you don't do it, the code does it, okay? Then it sets J equal to 2. Now I is 1 and J is 2. You come in here and you say, is I equal J? J? No, because 1 is not equal to 2. So that means you do this command. You set the 1, 2 element equal to 0, okay? And so you keep looping through this thing until J equals N. Obviously, I is never going to be equal J again. For, for I equal 1, right? So that means you fill in this whole row, a 1 there and all the rest zeros. Then you come back up here and it sets I equal 2. And then you start with J equal 1 again. And then you just keep looping through this thing. So then I is 2, J is 1. Are they equal? No. So you set that element to 0. You come through the next time, it increments J to 2, I is 2. Are they equal? Yes. Then you set the element equal to 1. And you just march through row by row. For, for each row, you march through each column, and then you march through each row until you're done. Okay? All right. So, this is how, I mean, it's not, I have to admit, this isn't one of my greatest achievements. But I'll, um, so, you know, then you use the, once you have this function here, you can use it. I don't have an N there. So you can either specify N or you can just specify the dimension. There's the 3 by 3, right? You see it? That's 3 by 3 identity matrix. There's the 10 by 10 identity matrix, right? So you see, the, the advantage of doing something like this is, well, first of all, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be smart if you did this because there's a built-in function in MATLAB that does the same thing. Okay, but whatever. That, that's not the point. The point is, let's say you needed to do this and there wasn't a MATLAB function to do it. You can always construct an identity matrix, 
by putting vectors together and concatenating them and stuff like that, but it's very inefficient. So once you realize you're going to do a certain calculation over and over again, and that MATLAB can't do it for you, that's when you write your own piece of code. Okay? This isn't a simple example because I knew you'd understand it, but I have to admit there is a function that does it already. Right? And there's also a function in MATLAB that gives you all ones, and there is a function in MATLAB that gives you a whole matrix of zeros too. Okay? But so if, you know, first thing you do, if an, you, you go into MATLAB and see if the function exists for the thing you want to do. If it exists, you obviously don't do it. But it, when you start doing things that are a little more advanced, they don't have to be that advanced. MATLAB won't have, it can't have a built-in function for everything everyone ever wants to do. <laughs> okay, so eventually you'll find something you want to do that you might have to write your own code for. Okay? All right. So that is how you use for loops. It's a little bit confusing because there's two, you know, ones inside the other. But the way to think of it is I is an index for the row and J for the column. All right. So let's say that you need to write this function. You might imagine, I have to admit, MATLAB has this function too, but I want to do it anyway. You want to calculate the factorial. So somebody gives you n and you calculate n factorial for them. Obviously, you could do this in MATLAB. If someone gave you 10, you could just multiply 10 times 9 times. It's not very efficient, okay? So you want to write a piece of code that will calculate the factor n factorial for any value n, okay? And so this is the little piece of code that does it. So the thing about coding, as you'll find, is if you approach the problem the right way, the code can be really small. If you approach it in a really bad way, the code might become really long and cumbersome <laughs> because you just haven't approached it the right way. But the way I'm approaching this problem is the following. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set f equal to n. Okay. So what does this function do? Somebody gives me n and I give them back the factorial of n. It's called f. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set f equal to n. Okay. And then I'm going to ask the question, is n greater than 1? Because if n's not greater than 1, as you'll soon see, n is equal to 1 and then I'm done. Okay. So let's say, for example, I want to calculate 3 factorial because I'm not very smart and I don't know what it is. So first of all, I'm going to set f equal to 3, and then I'm going to ask the question, is 3 greater than 1? The answer is going to be yes. Then I'm going to set n equal n minus 1. That'll make n equal 2, right? Then I'll multiply f times n. That'll be 3 times 2, and I'll store that result in f, okay? Then I'll go back through the loop, and now n is equal, what is it? n is equal to 2, right? 2 is greater than 1. Now I subtract... Um, 2 minus 1 is 1, and then I have f, which I had before, is 6, right? And I multiply that times 1, I get f equals 6. And now n is 1. It's not greater than 1, I'm done, you see? So I just go through here and sub I set f equal to n first, and then I multiply f times n minus 1 times n minus 2 until finally I multiply times 1, and then I'm done, <coughs> right? So it just... This, so this is an example of a while loop. I only want to do this, obviously I don't want to let n get negative, right? So I'm just going to do this until n gets to be 1, and after that I'm done. All right, so again, easy thing to use. Whoops. Okay? I mean, okay, you can calculate the factorial of anything you want. So obviously not hard. Of course, um, MATLAB does have a built-in function to do that as well. I think it's called that. So again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do this if um, that's a little too big, even for MATLAB. <laughs> okay. Let's see how high you can go. Okay, that's a big number. 10 to the 157th or something. All right, so that's how you use um, the while loop. So, without further ado, I think, here's your exercise. This will be a brain twister, perhaps, I don't know. This, this is a matrix, it's called the Hilbert matrix, okay? It's a matrix that has this structure. It's a square matrix where n is the number of rows and columns, and the entry of the matrix depend on n, so it's almost easier to look at this over here. So if you have a 3 by 3 matrix, the Hilbert matrix looks like this. Okay? All right? So in other words, 3 by 3, you got these elements here, right? And then over, over here, the, the, th the thing that you'll notice about this matrix, which is the key to solving this problem efficiently, is that 
you see there's a one here and then along each of the diagonals going this way, the, the number is exactly the same, right? So it doesn't matter if you're in the first column, second row, or the second column, first row, they're the same number. That, that's important in terms of solving the problem efficiently. I'm sure you don't need to exploit that if you want to solve it inefficiently, okay? All right. And so the reason this matrix is of interest, you know who Hilbert is, by the way? David Hilbert, he's an English math, he's one of the most famous mathematicians of all time. So when you start having lots of this, the Hilbert space, the Hilbert matrix, you might notice, I don't like to focus on this, but there's not the hints in anything. You might have gone to textbook, look in the index for Henson, you'll come up pretty much empty. But not if you search for Hilbert, okay? So this is a famous matrix because this matrix is what we know, which we'll talk about, something called, Ill con it's a famous ill-conditioned matrix, which we'll talk about. Okay, here's your job. And I think I may need to help you a little bit, okay, with this one. Your job is to write a function that creates a Hilbert matrix of any size n. So in other words, just like in those other things, I'm going to give you n, <coughs> And you have to spit back this matrix to me for any N I give you. All right. Let's see what I want to do to get you started here. I don't want to do that because that's the answer. <laughs> um, okay. So here's what I want you to, let me see, let me do something here. This is a little sneaky. All right. Um, it's one of these things where if you, if you don't know how to do it, it actually looks really hard. But if you see my piece of code, you'll, you'll all be leaving here in one minute because that's how simple it is. So, okay, so let me give you some hints, right? And then I, th this, is, this is my claim, that you can write a function that looks like this. Everyone knows how to write a function, right? You're going to open up a function thing in MATLAB, and it's going to start with this word here, not surprisingly. Okay, you aspire to return a matrix. So... I'm going to call this thing H. You can call anything you want, but H for Hilbert because I want to, okay? And then I'm going to call my function Hilb because I think there's a problem with Hilbert. It's like a built, some built-in function in MATLAB for something else. So I, That's one thing in MATLAB. If you ever start seeing something that acts really weird, sometimes there's a name conflict. Like I'm, I named this Hilbert and then it started saying, you can't do that. Oh. Anyway, Hilb's safe. Okay, and so the idea here is I'm going to issue a command like this. I want to get a matrix A, Hilbert, you know, four, four by four Hilbert matrix. That's how I want to use the function, okay? All right, so you, it takes some value N that the user supplies with a command like that, and then it has to spit back this Hilbert matrix, okay? So here's, here's my claim, that the way you want to do this First of all, it's a matrix, right? Remember the identity matrix? First, you want, probably want to have two loops, one for the rows and one for the columns, okay? <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to do. Let's make sure I don't do anything stupid. Okay? So first of all, I'm going to have this statement. That'll, that'll cycle through each row, okay? And then I'm going to have this statement. That'll cycle through each column, right? So it's just like the identity matrix. You'll start with the first row, and then you'll go every column in the first row. Then you'll go to the second row, every column in the second row, okay? And then, <laughs> of course, I'm going to leave out the critical thing, which is what you do, okay? But, um, so here, here's my claim, okay? That you can put a command in here, like you have to return this H, All you have to do is figure, figure out what goes over there, okay? You, you understand the structure of this, though? So I want to construct this matrix. It's square. So I'm going to set up these two loops. The first loop is going to cycle through every row. This will do every column, okay? And then this command here, to use this command, or to take advantage of this command, you should do the following. Take advantage of the fact that this matrix has a particular structure and the structure is, the only thing that matters is, is um, the sum of the row and column, right? <clears throat> so for example, you understand that I have a dot, 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 but it would be one-third, one-third, one-third along this line here. That means if the row and the column add up to three, it's one-third, right? It can be either, or is that, is that right? 
So actually, they add, add up to four, right? If the row and the column are both one, then you get one, obviously. But if, if the row and the column add up to, to two, that it's one half, right? So you can be either in the first row, second column. That's not right. Let me try to. <laughs> OK. If they add up to two, which means you have to be in the first row and first column, it's one. If they add up to three, which means you're in the first column, first row, or first row, second column. <laughs> I'm going to bash my head on this. It's, it's actually pretty hard, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to, come to think of it. All right, I'm going to start over here. If you are in either the first row, second column, or first column, second row, that's both one half. The only thing that matters is, does the sum of the position of the row and the column equal three? If it equals three, it's one half. If it equals four, it's one third. If it equals five, you know, so on and so forth. So that's the key thing you have to know or take advantage of to figure out what this should be. Okay, I can't do, if I, do, if I did any more and put it in the question mark, that's the whole thing. Okay? So here's how this often works, if you're anything like me. You try something you think will work, right? And oh yeah, by the way, when you do this, no chalk, be, be sure to put a semicolon over there when you're done. Otherwise, it'll print out every time through the loop. It'll be annoying. Um, so the way this normally works when I wrote this function is that I tried something and then I ran it to see if it gave me what I want. Because I know what the three by three Hilbert matrix should be, so I'm confident if I produce that, I probably have something that works. Okay, this is your challenge. I'm just going to sit here and see if you, can over, if you can address this challenge. It's a really simple thing over here. It just involves I and J. That's it, as you might imagine. So the way that I always write something like this is I, I just go through case by case. What do I want this thing on the right-hand side to evaluate to if I and J are both equal to 1? Okay. What do I want I and J to evaluate to if I is 1 and J is 2? Or I is 2 and J is 1 should evaluate to the same thing, 1 half, right? And I just go through that until I think I've got something that generalizes to the first few rows and columns and then I give it a run. You know what I mean? By give it a run, issue a command like this with 3 in there, for example, and see if it gives me back what I want. What's the problem with the chalk today? And the first, um, the first person that, um, <clears throat> tell me if this is a desirable prize. I think actually it's something you should reject forthright, but I'm going to offer it to you anyway. And it, see this thing's of Altoids? I reach in here routinely with my dirty hands, okay? But if you are the first one, you may too reach in here and grab an Altoid, okay? I, I know it's, it's enticing. Let the competition begin, okay? Let's go. Make sure you only grab one Altoid though, all right? So obviously at some point I'm going to give you the answer, but I at least want you to try, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yep. See, he's already got it. Have you coded before? Or are you just lucky? I took Okay, see. He's got a little experience, but still. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Huh? I think that's right. Show me what it gives you. Uh, 